Okay, good morning, this is Rob Beeson. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of the first uh, slide here, it says 2020. Uh, this was supposed to be August, uh, April the 20th, I think, that I was to uh, present to the Dallas uh, Garden Club, and I'm happy to be here uh, a little late, but and uh, on the airways, but uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. Again, I thank you, uh, Chris Rupp and the, and the others who uh, have graciously uh, invited me, and I understand we'll even plan on a, a trip to the garden later this summer. So this is a, a photo from the back of the house, and the back of the house is uh, uh, where we've, God's really blessed us. We, we live at the northern edge of uh, Independence city limits. So my backyard's a 300 acre uh, grass field. And as you'll find out from an old boy from Kansas uh, farmland, it's heaven. So uh, I mentioned Kansas. I was born and raised on a farm in the uh, northwestern part of Kansas, McDonald, Kansas, population of about 300. And I remember our garden was not, I thought it was huge uh, at the time. I was, I think part of the reason I, I thought that it was my job every spring to spade it. And it seemed pretty big. I went back later. It was probably 25 by 50 feet, something like that. Not a real large garden. But uh, my grandparents both had, had gardens. Uh, my father's uh, parents lived in town, but they, they had a, a garden. I remember my job as a kid was to follow my grandpa as he spaded the thing and dig out the worms. And uh, we put them in a, what seemed to be like a five-gallon a crock filled with uh, coffee grounds that my grandmother kept and put in there and kept all the worms in the coffee ground. And, and we kept that in what was called, they call it the uh, storm cellar or uh, the fruit cellar. But basically these are bunkers. They're concrete bunkers from oh, 10 to 20 feet um, in well underground with a big cupola uh, on the top. And you'd open the door, going down, and then be dark, but there would be a lot of uh, fruit. And, and my, both my grandmothers canned fruit. Both had gardens. And I remember uh, uh, my mother's parents, she did a lot of, uh, of canning of uh, their fruit into jams. And go downstairs and... It was, yeah, I had mixed feelings about going into, into those because they were also storm cellars and we rode out hailstorms and tornadoes and those things too. Uh, but I, I always have, this is my roots is farming, of, of, uh, of um, having gardens in the, uh, it, I, then I went to grade school, high school uh, in Colorado. We, we um, moved to, in the corporate, in the uh, Colorado Springs area in 1960, uh, about 57, I graduated from high school in 61. Uh, my wife Alice uh, graduated from Arvada High School in 61, that's outside of Denver. And it was a five acre truck farm as well. So we're both similar backgrounds. Uh, my youth group in Kansas and her youth group in uh, Colorado uh, went to the same church camp and that's where we met. We were married in 64. Uh, I got a BS and MS in mechanical engineering from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, graduating in 66, and finally by 69, we'd, we'd saved enough money to buy our first home. It's five acres outside of uh, the Air Force Academy at about 6,000 feet, um, wooded, uh, rocks, gravel. Um, but I, after, I think it was two or three years, I, I did do some gardening, with some success, I had a, I remember in the back of the property, we had a little uh, flat area that had some uh, wild strawberries. And I, whoa, so I brought them up, carefully planted them, watered, fertilized, and the, the plants grew to be like the size of a watermelon, just filled with little blossoms. I thought, this is going to be great. When they turned red, they were about the size of peas. So that was my first experience was <laughs> with raising uh, strawberries, uh, unfortunately, that didn't turn out very well. In fact, not very well 
Uh, I didn't have much success with hardly anything there with the deer and the birds and uh, 6,000 feet, you could have killing frost in the Memorial Day and Labor Day, on the, so it was short. The only success I had was I built a, a coal frame right outside of our home uh, in the back side with where the, the, uh, our bedroom was, and I vented the heat vent that went to the bedroom through that, built a 4 by 8 uh, coal frame, and I had tomatoes till in November. It worked okay. Our bedroom was cold, but at least we had some tomatoes. So that was my first experience with, with coal frames and trying to extend the season. Um, and then in uh, 1974, we moved to uh, the Bay Area. Uh, I went to work out of college for Hewlett Packard Company. And uh, it was a great company and really a, a lot of good experiences. That, uh, I wound up working for 44 years from 1966. I retired in 2011. Or early, uh, early 2010. So the first move with the company, which I had requested, was to California. We bought a home in the Bay Area, south of the Bay Area, in the Monterey area. And uh, it was a new home on about probably a third of an acre, uh, steep slope to the south, sand, ready soil, but okay. Um, we lived there, I think, three summers. And the second summer, I, I had time to finally get some gardening going. I had a row of uh, peas. My favorite plant is the little marvel peas. Like, uh, I just love those things. So I, I had a row about 20 feet long, and it came up pretty well. And uh, I was going to show the family my new row of peas and went out, and they were completely gone. When I'd seen them, they were about two, three inches high. We had a lot of quail in the area. A covey of quail came in and wiped me out. So I got some... some um, wire mesh, uh, chicken mesh, and made a little cupola over it, and that's, so that's the way I got peas going. I had one um, pear tree, and a deer got that. I could see the, the, uh, the, the footprints. I had uh, two artichokes that were about a foot high, and uh, one morning I went out, and one was only about six inches high. And I, What's going on? There's a mole under there pulling that artichoke down and ruined the whole thing. So between the moles and the deer and the quail and, uh, and snakes in the garden, uh, I had a, a tough time. But I tried, it, with two young children at the time, that wasn't my top priority. So that was my gardening in, in, uh, in California. Then we moved, we lived there about three and a half years, got kind of homesick for Colorado. And uh, we, we bought a home close to where I had graduated in high, from high school. And uh, there it was, the, the name of the street was Rock Hill Road. And there, when I say more Colorado sand and rocks, there we are again. There was nothing there for the soil. And, and uh, I think the second summer was there, I, I got to have a garden. So we trucked in a, one load of dirt. I uh, spread it out, and it was probably three or four inches deep over the rock and sand. And, and uh, the first thing I realized that, that that dirt was full of weeds and uh, we lived at the top of a hill that had low, low water pressure because it, anyway, it was a total disaster. That was, that was my second uh, not so good experience I learned uh, on, on gardening. And then we moved uh, to Idaho. Al had a, a brother who lived in Boise and we bought a new home on an acre. Uh, on the west of Boise in Meridian, Idaho. And uh, that was, they call that the Treasure Valley, and it's just, it's fantastic. Uh, that particular, um, that particular area, uh, I call that the, the days of the, of the Victory Garden. I've, I religiously watched the Victory Garden and how to grow things and read Mother Earth News, and I had a, uh, about a third of an acre probably of, of garden and, and a, an orchard, and, the, uh, and a third of uh, a big lawn, and, and of course our home. Uh, but uh, that was, I think, the best and the most learning experience that I had. We, we were there about five years, and I had a garden in there, about three of it. And uh, I learned a lot about uh, cultivating. I had a uh, nice big rototiller and a uh, big mulch pile, and. Uh, we had, again, my peas. You ask my, my daughters about our peas, 
And they remember being on the de back deck with trying to shell about a, about a bushel and a half of peas one afternoon. And they, this is too much for them. I had, I had a big freezer, got a big chest freezer, got a fruit dryer making uh, uh, fruit leather and, and the whole nine yards. Uh, the kids were getting old enough that uh, we, we were interested in a better education, so I had a, um, a friend of mine who was the engineering manager for the inkjet facility in uh, Corvallis. We were just starting, this is 1985, just starting to get into the inkjet business. And so we wound up taking a job there, and so we've been an Oregonian since 1985. We first, our first home was uh, at the west, in, in, north end of uh, Corvallis. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Vineyard Mountain, and so it's fairly high altitude. Again, rocks, sand, um, uh, and I had a few tomatoes, but not much of anything. So the next few years, uh, then we, we were there seven years, moved to Adair Village, built a new home there, and uh, it was a, not just a city lot, so about all I had was some grapes and things like that. So uh, in 1999, we moved to Lebanon uh, on Tyler Hill, south of Lebanon, elevation about 1,000 feet. Again, steep, north slope, lots of trees. Um, so I, I uh, sold about 20 cords of wood uh, to get me a place to, to have a, a garden. Finally, about the third, we lived there 17 years. It was the third or fourth year before I actually was able to, to get a garden. And that's where I started the, the uh, raised bed. Um, it was the only way, you know, to have anything there. It was, I had seven raised beds that were 16 feet by 10 feet, about 10 to 12 inches of, of uh, garden soil that I, I put in. I had uh, three beds of uh, strawberries where I, I learned uh, the only way to keep strawberries is you got to put netting over it, the critters there, something else. Um, I had a four-foot fence around the garden. Deer jumped right over that, so I had to put another seven-foot uh, addition to that. Uh, wild turkeys. Um, one night I, I kept seeing my plums were on the ground, and so I went out with a flashlight. Here are four eye, little sets of eyes looking at me. They were small um, uh, little critters that had gotten in there. and. Uh, so I finally had to, uh, there were little raccoons and, and one, one was even trying to kill one of my trees by scratching on it. So raccoons, birds, uh, animals, I, I struggled uh, to, uh, I think more with the critters than about any other issue. Uh, I got a siren that would blow away uh, birds. It did, but it also made all the dogs within a quarter of a mile how so that didn't work. I found netting is the only way to, to really control birds. Uh, finally, and, and uh, by 2016, we realized that this was not going to be a, a home uh, for us to retire in. Uh, our, we have children in West Salem and um, in Lebanon at the, in, at the time, or in Albany, so we thought we'd move someplace else. To make a long story short, we wound up at the air, air park. In, uh, in Independence and uh, bought a home that uh, we liked, but it didn't have, it had a great big back garden, but it was all, backyard, but it was all grass, and a, and a rather small plane hanger, which we converted to a, a uh, craft room for my wife and both daughters, all the crafters, and the rest was warehouse. And we were in there less than a year, and it really wasn't what, uh, my wife Alice and I either really wanted, and it turns out our, our daughter uh, and her husband, who live in West Salem, wanted to move. So they bought our house, and we had a, finally had an opportunity to build. And uh, we had, when we first went there in 2016, uh, to look, there was a, a vacant lot on the west end that was the only way, the only one on the very, very north end of town that was still in, unbuilt on. So we were just felt, felt so grateful uh, that it did open up for us, so we were able to start building. 
So here we are, finally had what Alice wanted in terms of a, of a craft room and, and I had a big backyard to work with. So with that, uh, we, uh, we started out, I thought, well, okay, now I have this, what am I going to do with it? So I did have some basic goals and uh, I found in the, in the past you want to, I have the P's and the W's, you want to have good three P's, plant, prune, and pick. And the W's you don't want to fool with, watering and weeds. So from what I had learned in, over the years and, and, and watched in, of uh, how some of the uh, truck farms actually operate, with an engineering background and, and I've always been a tinkerer, so I, I started designing uh, the backyard with uh, several things in, in mind here. I wanted to certainly uh, uh, maximize the growing season, so that means some way of getting your plant started early and some way of, of extending it out you can in the fall as long as possible. So uh, I have some elements here, water usage, tilling and weed and so on. What we'll do in the next few minutes is I'll, I'll, I'll go through each one of these and try to uh, indicate how I attacked it uh, and to, to solve those issues. And the other thing that had occurred to me over the years is that uh, we were to the point in our lives, you know, mid-70s, that having a big warehouse full of, of or a freezer full of frozen goods is not really what I want to do anymore. That uh, uh, the Lord been so good to us that I, I decided that most of what I, that I grew, I would give away. And uh, so uh, that was something new, uh, but uh, I, felt, I felt that was really the right thing to do. So what you're seeing now again is, is the, uh, this is from the, we're standing in the, in, the, in the grass field now looking at the, at the north end of the house, and you'll see at the front there, little white uh, objects are two foot square, mini raised beds, I call them. We'll get into that a little later. And uh, so there's the layout here with uh, melons and pumpkins over here, six of them. And it's, the, the air park is interesting because you get 20 feet of free real estate that you don't have to pay for. What happens is so that right along here in the front is a taxiway. And you're not allowed to have anything over I think it's 18 inches high for the wings of the planes to go by. It's not really your property, but you can utilize it. There's a ditch in there, and, and both the neighbors, a lot of people, you, instead of the ditch, you put in a culvert, and then you can put soil in it. So, so I have almost, it's uh, 20 feet by almost 100 feet total in here that I can utilize. That's this. And so that's where I put all the, the low uh, melons. Here's a strawberry. Uh, I'll discuss this a little later, but there are 36 strawberry plants in there. And then I built a, uh, I used a five foot chain link fence across here, which make great. Right now I've got snow peas like that right in here. I just picked some this morning, put out in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, oh, one other thing I forgot. To, so when I'm giving it away, I'll show you a little later, but I've got a little fruit stand out in front, which I call the Garden of Eden front fruit stand. So, uh, uh, so this is, this is uh, all melons and squash, so I've got peas in here and over here, three rows of corn, and uh, uh, I'm also influenced by my bride of 56 years who sit here with us, Salas, uh, as I mentioned, she was born on a farm too. Uh, she loves fresh fruit. She's not a canner. She's not really a gardener, but she likes, there's some certain, uh, she loves fresh fruit and vegetables. So uh, she likes uh, Concord grapes. So those are Concord grapes, either seed or seedless. There are five of them. And seedless grapes. We, all everyone likes raspberries. And blueberries, 11 of those. So these are actually three foot wide, and, and th this is not quite to scale, they're three foot uh, wide raised beds and a three foot wide path in between. So you can get a, you can get a, 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 
a, like a wheelbarrow in. So, and when we did the concrete down here at the bottom, I had them pour a four foot walkway from the back of our porch all the way to the run, runway. So this is, this is right here as you see the tarmac. And uh, I built a eight foot by 12 foot greenhouse. And I, we, I framed it at our other home and we had the kids and all of us rented a U-Haul and as they were framing that, Oh, well, they were pretty well framed, but we put that up. I, I beat them. I, I had that done before they did with some help from contractors. So anyway, the, I've got the, the uh, concrete going uh, right up to the greenhouse. So I, I had it all. This is what I started with, basically. So what do I want to do? What are the parameters? And what do I want to raise? Those were the goals. So we'll start through these, accomplishing the goals. Water usage. Um, what I found is you want to minimize, you know, the soil. And how you do that, you, you use uh, landscape fabric everywhere you can. The other, the other, uh, the other issue, which I never, I've done a little bit of drip gardening, but not much. But I, I realized that uh, that. Uh, the water savings are tremendous. I was surprised. It was like probably a fourth or even less of the water usage for drip when, when I used to spray. So I went 100% drip irrigation. Uh, when we built the house, uh, I had a, the contractor who was doing the front uh, uh, have a 12, a 12 circuit drip system. I can use up to 12. Uh, I'm using 10 currently, so the uh, I'm using 10 different circuits, each of which almost every uh, raised bed does have a, a little valve that I can turn on or off, so I can I can adjust the the uh, the time each each circuit wants to go, and I can actually uh, shut off individual pockets. So anyway, uh, with with the use of landscape cloth. In the watering system drip, I, I cut, for example, the house that we had in the home in, uh, on the first one we got in, 196, in uh, 2016 on Sky Raider, we had water, uh, the normal winter water bill is about $110 base. And I had one as high as $275 with a big lawn, sprinkling a lot of lawn. The, the highest water bill I had last year was $179, and I'm doing a lot with it. So it's really amazing how that helps. Uh, the other thing about use, utilizing the uh, fabric extensively is you really don't have... I sold my rototiller. I, you don't need it uh, um, with the mini raised beds. Uh, I did have... Uh, uh, You'll notice back here on the uh, on the layout that the corn had one one foot. So I have, I have corn rows three feet apart with one foot uh, of of slit in it just for the corn. So that's uh, uh, let's see. Winterizing is uh, fairly easily be, uh, easily done. Uh, you don't have any weeds in the pro problem in the winter because I I go in and I cover all these little uh, mini raised beds with with the fabric, so it's all just covered. Uh, soils, the biggest job I had for about three weeks in, in September was uh, 90 yards of Grossman. There were six loads, 15 yards a piece. I had lots of calluses. But it was, I think it was worth it because you, you got to have the good, the good foundation. So what, what I have, let's go back here to uh, this. So what we have here, this is all, I used a two by eight, so there are about seven inches of topsoil over this whole area, about seven inches here, and these are, uh, again, it's about seven, eight inches uh, of topsoil, and again, so you have seven or eight inches plus, so here's what we have. The entire area is, let's say seven inches, eight inches deep of this uh, really good soil. And then you add about three and a half to four inches because that's a two by four above that. So you have about 10 inches of topsoil 
uh, for all of your products. If later on down, I have some other uh, indications about potential for the future, but I'll mention it now. Uh, sustainability is also an issue, possibly. Uh, what's, ha what's going to happen to that soil over time? I could move them, just cut it out and move them. Um, so I have some flexibility there. So really it gives you a lot of flexibility is I think the, the point that I wanted to make. Uh, so again, um, as I mentioned, these are all 2.8 two pressure treated and then I painted them. I just used house paint, good, uh, good quality house paint. Um, and then, uh, so here are the two in, they're two by four pressure treated and painted and they're either two foot square boxes or three foot square boxes. If we go back here, uh, these are your, there are 14 of these, these are the three foot, everything else is two foot. And, I, and then I can just pop these uh, frames over uh, for, okay, so. Yes, question? Are they sitting on the ground or are they sunk into the ground? Uh, the question was the two by four sitting into the ground or, or just sitting on top of the uh, fabric? Yes, they're just sitting on top of the fabric. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, it's almost a, a, a foot of good topsoil. And the fruit trees, uh, let's go back here. Uh, You can barely see on this side of the house, but there's about 20 feet from our from this side of the house to the property line uh, that I have. I'll show you a picture later on of just of the of the orchard, and uh, there I didn't do anything except uh, as far as uh, soil preparation, except just uh, uh, I just enlarged the holes, you know, and, and filled it with some garden mix when they were first planted. And they seem to be doing, doing pretty well. Uh, I had one of the first things I asked the neighbors is, what about the soil? Oh, it's terrible. It'll only grow uh, grass. It's that clay. And if it's dry, it's terrible. It's, but I found when I, was, uh, when I was doing some post holes for some of the posts, you know, the, the big posts, about 18 inches down. This was in August, and it was still moist down there. It, it, so there's some when it's wet, I haven't found it to be that much of a problem. I don't know. Uh, that some of you have probably a lot more, more experience than clay, but I haven't found it. I've had it a lot better than rocks and sand, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I've read, and it looks to me like, uh, and you see everything seems to grow pretty well, I haven't had any particular issues with, uh, with what you might clay problems. Pests are really... Uh, at least mitigated to a, to a large extent with this because you don't have much soil exposed. And uh, like the uh, in back where I have the two foot boxes for the melons and things, I just, I put some bait control or I even, uh, this year I sprayed some um, home, home, defense, home defense around, just around the printer on the, on the uh, fabric itself and uh, you don't have those bugs crawling in up, up into, the, into the plants. So that was help. Here's what I did here. Uh, with, uh, with at least two foot of spacing, and when you're, in, when you're walking in the, in the garden, all you're doing is you're walking on that fabric. And so uh, there you just don't have the opportunity, I don't think, for, for uh, if you're vigilant about picking up your fruit that's fallen, you don't have that opportunity for, uh, for bugs to to uh, you know, to even to, to get there, uh, I do use some uh, organic uh, insecticides, uh, and I mentioned here about the phone. Uh, what I for I first got onto that was I noticed the strawberry farmers they have this huge, all you see is this black, and the little little holes in the plants, and that's what really got me onto. And this is what I did in Lebanon uh, for strawberries because the berries you know are on the on the most of them anywhere, are not exposed to the, uh, to the uh, soil. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, all kinds of problems with, with uh, 
birds and berries, and I've only, the only thing I've found is netting. I'm doing some experimenting. This is the first year in about two weeks I'll be able to tell you if it works because we've got pie cherries that are on. We have a lot of pie cherries this year for little trees, and they're just beginning to start to turn. It's a new product. I shouldn't say new product, but it's a spray on, and uh, I talked to the manufacturer. It's a small company in, in Wisconsin or anyway, up in that area. That this, I talked to the salesman. It's one of my grandfather started this company. It, there is a chemical, a food grade chemical, maybe some of you have heard of it, that, that uh, it's been used for years. It, you spray it on, it's like I said, it's a food grade, FDA, and you can eat the fruit up to f within four hours uh, time after it's sprayed. And it's, you mist it on, and it, it, has a, it has an odor, it said it's like a skunk to us, and, it, and so it, it puts the odor on there. Uh, and uh, if it works, I'll, I'll, I'll get, get more information out. But, and I'm really excited about it. They, the, uh, the salespeople say that uh, they sell it a lot, even to the vineyard in Oregon and every place, that this has replaced netting in a lot of, a lot of... You have to repeat it about every week, and what their secret ingredient is it's a surfactant and a, uh, another chemical that, that, that keeps, it's apparently a, like a thin powder that, that forms on the leaf. Uh, if it rains, you've got to redo it. And before, that, they've, they've uh, developed this process that, that will allow that to stay on. With, it's a lot more robust. So we'll see. Uh, maybe some of you, of you have, have heard of this. I hadn't, so I'm really excited about... about uh, being able to do this. Winterization, uh, as I mentioned, uh, virtually all, everything is covered with the, uh, with the fabric, so it's really nice when you, when you uh, go to the spring and, and uh, rip off the, the fabric and you're, you're good to go. Uh, one of the issues with a drip system is uh, granulated, uh, Soil amenities and things like that are pretty much out because you don't have that opportunity uh, for that to, to soak down. I used to always use uh, the 16, 16, 16. You know, when, when Bymart has them for sale for, for 10 bucks, I, I get a bunch of them. And I've always just thrown a handful down below the azaleas or the rhodes and, and that's about it, and roses. I use it for everything. So I got to thinking about. Well, you know, and I looked at the at the, uh, the Miracle Grow, uh, um, yeah, there Miracle Grow, and I looked at what what's in it. It's rather low uh, nitrogen, but it's got some potassium and some other stuff in it. So I thought, well, I really like this. I've used it for everything, but it's not applicable in liquid form. So I, I got some and I soaked it and uh, I, I had uh, particles in the bottom of it that weren't, weren't uh, mixed up. And then I got to reading about, okay, what, what, what does Miracle Grow have in it? And I found a, uh, a product here that's this Greenway Biotech and it's, it's 21.5% of uh, a potassium, it's a potassium mic, uh, magnesium mix. So I add that to it and I mix it all up and uh, I use my little, an old blender because those, I think it's in the 16, 16, 16 to keep it long, long acting. So it just doesn't dissolve as quickly. So you'll have a handful of these beads at the, at the bottom of the five gallon bucket that you've mixed up. And uh, you mix all that up into a kind of puree it, put it all together, keep it stirred, and now I use either, I've got a little 16 ounce uh, glass I call God's Love. So it's God's Love and there's, there you get a, a cup full of God's Love on each plant, uh, and it's really worked well, it's uh, so far. Um, uh, let's see, you have to use it pretty quickly because it, it settles out, but it's no, pout, no problem. Um, you know, what I did on the, on the, the uh, 
wrote on the corn last year, so I just went along with one of the bucket. And I just poured it along, and it was about, yeah, that was a two-gallon bucket, and I had corn rows about 30 feet, and I said, I'm going to dump this on. I did it three or four times, and uh, the corn turned out pretty well. So you'll see when you come over, hopefully, uh, how it's looking. Uh, Acceptable yields are somewhat tied, uh, by yield I mean how much fruit you're really going to get the whole entire season. And so I, I try to start the plants as early as I can in the, in the spring. I, uh, most of the, of the uh, melons, I think all the melons and uh, cantaloupe and some, most of those were all started with seed. I buy uh, the tomatoes, uh, if they're if they're local, good sized tomatoes, and and I put them in the in the uh, uh, coal bed as, as soon as possible. So I'll I'll explain a little more of that in a few minutes. But so in, in the uh, in the spring I have uh, I call it the halfway house. Uh, it doesn't show too well here, but it's it's right behind. There's the the greenhouse. Well, the first year that we lived there. In 2018, in the fall, the only thing I had was a, a two, two foot by eight foot by 10 inch deep little coal frame that I had raised bed that I put right on the south end of that. And it came fall, and this is it. This is the, that's the, uh, where I had tomatoes. I had three tomato plants in there. It was getting fall, and so I, I bought this little greenhouse to put over it. So we had tomatoes the first year until Thanksgiving or so. So the, 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 in the spring what I do is I start the plants across the wall right here in the greenhouse. When they get two leaves are showing or more, it depends on what it is, and I'll bring it in here. It's really a coal frame, it's a big coal frame. So I can put a heater in here in the, in the fall and extend it. And then in the spring I put a, a sheet of uh, plywood over this and then I can use it for just a, uh, a platform to, to uh, winterize or, or say uh, the transition in which, a, which a coal frame does. So in the spring I did that and then in the fall this is what I had the first year. I had this was the, the, uh, th the three tomatoes and you can see here this was taken I don't know probably s September October and so I could cover it. I had a heater in there, uh, one of these uh, 1500 watt, you can go six or nine or 1600 watts, and uh, close it up. And I had, I had uh, more problem with, t with cracking than I did anything else. The tomatoes were, and I didn't, I didn't choose the right variety. Uh, I had been told that, oh, you need to go with, uh, these are actually uh, grafted. And I got two, two plants that had three three varieties uh, grafted to one plant. And that didn't work out. What I, my experience with grafting like that was that one of the, one of the uh, varieties dominated and the other two just withered. So I learned a lot about grafting uh, in last year, uh, the first year. Uh, so this year, uh, I've, I've, again, oh, I'm through with it as a, as a halfway house and I've got some three small tomato plants in there. Uh, they're ones that I started from seed, uh, some that you can't get locally, that which are uh, some that I really like. So that's sustainability. That's a big question. I just don't know. I'm in my second year now. I know that uh, this liquid fertilizer really works, but I don't know how long it's going to work. I mentioned there are some things that you can do. Uh, you could put soil conditioners, and you can rotate the crops fairly easily. You've got these two foot and three foot uh, mini, mini raised beds, so you can put, and I'm already doing that this year, I'm raising, changing the crops around. Uh, this was the orchard. This was taken from the front of the house, and uh, I wanted a little of everything. People said you can't grow peaches here, and I'm finding out they're right. 
I'm having real trouble. But I had a couple of them. I had two, now I only have one, because I got rid of it. I, but hazelnuts, I was really surprised. We had a few hazelnuts the very first year, so uh, one of the peaches that I, I didn't like, I took it out, and there was one of the, the uh, pears, I think, that we didn't like, so I, I replaced it. So anyway, we, right now we have six cherry trees. Uh, half of them are the, the uh, pie cherry. Alice loves pie cherries. She's an outdoor girl. And uh, so, uh, and she likes uh, plums, uh, Italian plums. So anyway, a little of everything. And so far, uh, we had a few, a few of uh, about everything last year, not much. This year, uh, I don't think we're going to have any um, apricots. It was cold and they were blooming. And also some of the plums, most of the plums, different varieties of plums were, were uh, we're uh, just blooming t too early, and, but we've got a lot of cherries and, and peaches, quite a few peaches, pears, and apples. So when you come to see, we'll see what, how, how it's going uh, at that time. So now giving most of the produce away, uh, the first thing I, I mentioned was it's, it's a good neighbor. It's a good neighbor. Uh, the first year, I remember I, I had my first, uh, I had, I, there was a new garden group in uh, in the air park. It's called Air Park Gardeners, and I had I joined that, and and so uh, uh, we. I asked them if I told them what I wanted to do. I had I built this when we were building the house. Um, my contractor said if you want to have good things done, you got to feed them coffee and donuts. Make sure they're happy. So I built this thing, and uh, and we had coffee and donuts for the guys all in the winter. But I had a sign that said, this is for you. When it's done, it's going to be God's fruit stand in the front of the house for uh, the park. And so I asked the, the garden club, I said, this is what I want to do. And so we went together. Uh, and I remember on May, it was May 22nd of 2000. 19 when I first, that was the first day, I, and I remember putting an email out there, about 230 houses in the air park, and I had about, I wound up with about 55 who signed up for, uh, for emails, because it was not a good idea to keep e emailing people, but, so I said, this, this fruit stand is going to be open 8 to 6 daily, uh, and this is on May 22nd. And I think it was July when, when we had company, my sister came out, and we went away for a week, and I realized, it's so good to get away. What's happening here? And I realized that, that daily means seven days a week. I was really getting stressed, trying to, find, trying to make sure that I had something out there most every day for people. People loved it. You know, it, was, it, was, it went over really, really well. <laughs> my uh, my wife Alice's people really like that, but there were some other issues. I yeah, Alice. Out of the garage and he scared me to death yeah, because my car started beeping and I thought it's beeping. Why is it beeping? Well, our car saw him because yeah, so he was small. But air, traffic traffic uh, cars coming in and out, and uh, they also we set it up so that any excess fruit would go to Ella Cure and Food Bank there in Independence. And so at the end of the year, uh, well, so I, I realized something's got to change next year because this isn't working. I, I, I retired to take it easy, not be stressed. And I, I loved being out back. It was the fruit stand was giving me problems. And actually, Alice said, well, I, I said, I'm not going to, we're not even going to have that fruit stand next year. It's just not worth it. And Alice said, uh, well, it turns out Ella Karen is open Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. So, and it's worked out great. So what we, we've got the, the fruit stand now is open two days a week from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Not 8, but 9. That's a big difference because what I try to do is when it's in, when it goes to the stand, I picked it that morning. And in fact, this year, I put on a face mask. I used uh, wipes wipe everything off. I try to keep people safe. So it's kind of a 
a little bit of an issue, but not, not hard, but it's certainly easy. So it's been great. Uh, so anyway, the produce is always free. So last year we had over, uh, I say sandwich bags. If it'll go in a sandwich bag, whether it's peas or uh, lettuce or something, that's, of course, tomatoes and bigger fruit, it just goes in as an individual piece. But, so I say uh, about 300 bags and a couple hundred of uh, individual items. And over 200 pounds of produce was donated to Ella Kieran Bank. And uh, so give it away. And the other, I, I mentioned here, um, the Bible commands us to feed the needy. I just put in one of the, one of the a Bible um, verse of Proverbs. The Ella Kieran Food Bank is, is a perfect way, I felt, of, of really. It's one thing to give it to your neighbors, but it's another thing which you're really commanded to do is to give it to the poor. So this year, uh, well, the other thing I, I mentioned, the way it's set up with Ella Kieran, you take your produce to the back, and then it's, it's weighed, and then you go to the front if you want a, a, a receipt. So I had a chance last year, numerous occasions, of, of actually meeting some of the people who, who really needed it and were using it. And that's, there's nothing more rewarding then to know that your, your fruit's going where it's really needed badly. So anyway, they were telling about a, a small, I didn't see this, but a small girl uh, went in and I had some pretty good sized pumpkins. She wrapped her arm around that pumpkin and she was not going to leave <laughs> until they left with that pumpkin. So it was neat. Uh, and I had a really nice thank you note last year. So the bottom line is this year, the first, the first fruits go to the family. Uh, it's more of a 10% kind of a thing, I guess. Um, I like peas, but we, we don't even have a big uh, freezer. Uh, we have a few things, but uh, basically what we eat and then, and then give it the rest of the way. And most of it's going to go to Ella Kieran this year, probably. So what I've tried to do here is, this is a little sign that's, that's on my door. It's, I call it God's Truck Farm. I'm just a temporary keeper, but I, th I think as long as I try to, uh, to use the liquid fertilizer and what I've got, I don't know, again, about the, how sustainable it is, but uh, it's somewhat unique, and the people who visited have, have felt it was kind of unique. So, uh, again, I want to thank uh, uh, you folks for inviting me to present today. Uh, and that's basically about all. Um, I look forward to having you maybe in July or sometime to, to visit, and we can we can discuss this a lot more then. It's a lot greener than it is. Oh, my! Alice said it's a lot greener than it is now. Right. I do have a question. I struggle with getting the very best soil mix, garden soil, uh, for my raised beds, and I always have poor luck. So I'm intrigued with where you get your soil. Yeah, the, it, uh, yeah. The question was, uh, uh, and I, the question was uh, getting a good soil mix from the local sources. Um, the one that I w used was one that my neighbors recommended. It's an independence, and I had one neighbor who said they got a, they got a, a, some soil from them that, that had weed seed. But most of this comes from the. Uh, the riverbed, and, uh, I, I, I feel that uh, that company would, would be uh, a good place to start. And also, uh, they're the ones who recommended uh, the pathways to go with half-inch minus uh, uh, road mix. And I was going to go with uh, um, probably bark dust or something like that. I'm talking about the three-foot walkways there. And, and so... The first layer, of course, is the uh, fabric, and then I've got the, the uh, I did use that, and it works great. It packs down nicely, and uh, so I, that, is that? So the name of the, the soil, where you got that? Yeah, it was, uh, let's go back here. Grossland and Weston, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's over the bridge? Yes, that's where, okay. right, yeah. Okay. Gross, Grossman and Weston. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And they were really good. They have good prices. Uh, got to know the truck driver was six, 
with six loads. He brought his little daughter along, and my wife Alice gave her some cookies. So you get to know these people. Uh, uh, so, Grossman and Westman. Uh, it's exciting. Um, I think more exciting to give it to Ella Curran than it is to give it to our neighbors because most of our neighbors can afford to go down to the grocery store and buy a piece, a big piece of broccoli or whatever, where, you know, there are a lot of people who like it but will not buy it. For those of you who may not have heard, my wife Alice was saying this, it's just a lot more rewarding to give it to Ella Karen than, than uh, your neighbors. It, it's great, uh, at least, uh, uh, and there are a number of our neighbors that uh, that uh, have a number of mouths mouth to feed, and they enjoy. It. I think some some stories about uh, some of the neighbors is one said those sugar uh, sugar baby watermelons are sweeter than anything I've ever tasted. He said I took some home, and my my husband was ah come on, one bite, and he was he was convinced. So that yeah. It's, any other? Go ahead. My other question is the K Magnesium, is that right? Yes. The, is it the, 0, 0, and a half? Yes. Uh, the question was on the fertilizer, and I'll, um, I can get that information to you. In fact, it's, there it is. Greenway Biotech. If you do Greenway Biotech 0021.5, you'll, you'll okay. yeah. In fact, I just, I bought another. 20 pounds of it uh, that comes in several sizes. But again, these are all available. I was going to talk about the mash here and the, and the how I build uh, the cages and the... Uh, I, I love the frames that you build. The frames, right. I use uh, 3 8 inch, uh, I think I mentioned in here, I use 3 8 inch uh, rebar and, uh, and remesh. You can see some here. That's, those are 6 inch and uh, they make really nice uh, trellises. You have a seven foot high trellis, three and a half feet wide, and with the, with the uh, posts on either side, I use the, the rebar. So yeah, we'll, we'll see a lot more when you come. So can you really cause a cucumber to climb a trellis? Can you cl cause a cucumber to climb a trellis? Say that five times. <laughs> I'm told you can, and you'll see it if it's doable. Oh, I, they're, right now, they're just about that high, and they're, they're starting out. Of course, the pole bean's great. I had two pole beans last year, and I, I thought I'd seen this, I'd heard of it, you know, at least on leaning ones. And I, I, you know, YouTube is fabulous for looking up things, and apparently you can. I don't know how much trouble it's going to be. Yeah. Okay, well, I've got one I'm ready to So, cucumbers on, we'll see. All right, well, thank you again.